Christian Deceptions in the End Time. That's the title of this next discussion that we're going to have. This lecture is going to look into the Bible at various concepts that are generally public knowledge at the moment. Please make sure that you have your Bible ready, that you can make sure that what I'm saying is biblical. And if you have to, pause it now so that you can go and fetch your Bible. Revelation 13 verse 3 and 4 say, And all the world wondered after the beast, and they worshipped the dragon which gave power to the beast. By now this text word is probably starting to make sense. All the world wondered after the beast. Do you remember who that was? The Antichrist beast? And by doing so they worshipped the dragon who is the devil and Satan. Acts 17 verses 1 to 4, read as following from the English Standard Version Bible. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, This is Jesus whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews were jealous, it says in verse 5. And taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeing to bring them out to the crowd. The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if those things were so. Here's a story about the apostles and Paul going as he does in his custom on three Sabbath days, wrestling with the people about this truth. And Silas also was joined and uh, or who was also there came and joined in on this discussion and not only were they in trouble for preaching this doctrine, but they left and they went on and went into a, a Jewish synagogue where the people were more possibly amiable or eager to receive the truth. And as these truths were explained to them, the quotation given is, they examined the scriptures daily to make sure if those things were so. Whatever we do in life, we have to make sure whether or that what we are experiencing is, is in line with the word. Jesus answered them and saying in Matthew 24 verse 4, Take heed that no man deceive you. you. Remember where the disciples come to Jesus and say, Lord, give us the sign. What will be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? The very first thing that Jesus says, Take heed that no man deceive you. And the only way to do that is to go back to scripture and check whether those things are so. And this is what these people were doing when this truth about Jesus Christ was being preached to them in the synagogue. They went back to scripture, in other words the Old Testament at the time, to check whether what they were saying could actually be true. And Revelation 16 verses 13 and 14 say the following. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles. I'll continue on with that quotation or that text in the next lecture entitled Signs and Lying Wonders. But just understand that here's an image of uh, unclean spirits coming out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast and the false prophet. And we'll have to find out who all of those are. Revelation 19 verse 20 says, And the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him. These were both or these both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. So this here in Revelation 19 speaks about the destruction of the beast. The beast was taken and with him the false prophet. Okay. Now I'm going to cover in this lecture four huge topics. Topics that I could possibly spend three or four lectures on each. But just because of the nature of the information we're covering... I've decided to squash four of them into one lecture. Christian deceptions at the end time. We're going to be looking at number one, changing the word. Number two, food for thought. Number three, hell. And number four, the secret rapture. 
Let's look for a moment at changing the word. If you go to any bookstore, Christian bookstore for that matter, or secular bookstore, and you go to the religious section, what you'll find there is a multitude of different Bibles. You have the New International Version, you have the King James Version, you have the New King James Version, you've got the Amplified Bible, the Message, the oh, you've got so many of them. How do you choose? Is there a difference between them? And if there is, what is the difference between them? Should you go for the original, more stale, as it were, the, the more difficult language? Should you go for the Bible like that, or should you go for the more modern English? There's an idea that somehow the modern English Bibles have got um, more light in them, more truth. Which one do you choose? Well, if you go to BibleGateway.com, what you'll see there immediately, and I've just clicked on the list of available Bibles, is the number that are just available on this one website. The New International Version, the New American Standard Bible, the Message, the Amplified Bible, the New Living Translation, King James, English Standard Version, Contemporary English, all of these, and this is just the English section. What's up with all these Bibles? What's up with all these Bibles? Why so many versions? Which one is true? Are they all true? Notice for a moment as we bring back the graphic, BibleGateway.com. Do you see on the left-hand side there the, any symbolism or imagery that's allowing you to realize who they're affiliated to? The Baal Haddad? Let's continue. Von Dobschutz, in The Influence on the Bible on page 136, says the following. Wherever the so-called counter-reformation, started by the Jesuits, gained hold of the people, the vernacular was suppressed and the Bible kept from the laity. So eager were the Jesuits to destroy the authority of the Bible, which the paper pope of the Protestants, as they contemptuously called it, that they even did not refrain from criticizing its genuineness and historical value. What he's saying here is that the Jesuits, in their attempt to try and get the Reformation to disregard the Bible, and they call it the paper pope of the Protestants, they contemptuously called it, well, wh they didn't even stop from questioning its, questioning its genuineness and its authority. That's today one of the reasons why so many people are saying, the Bible isn't really true. The Bible is quite clear though, in Isaiah 8 verse 20 it says, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is a little bit of light in them. No, a little bit of light. It says it is because there is no light in them. So how does this work? Well, Revelation 22 verse 18 and 19 say the following. If any man add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of this book, of prophecy, God will take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. A very stern warning. Don't fiddle with the word of God because you'll be in trouble. That one is specifically pertaining to Revelation, but that's the general gist of anybody fiddling with the word. Matthew 4 verse 4 is very clear. It says, but Jesus answered, he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by Every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Now we can go and do a whole biblical analysis on where the various Bibles come from and the three main streams, etc., etc., etc. But we don't have time to do that today. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you just from some quotations what the scholars are saying about the various Bibles that are available. This quotation comes from Which Bible and True or False, Dev edited by David Otis Fuller. He says, so the present controversy between the King James Bible in English and the modern versions is the same old contest fought out between the early church and rival sects and later between the Waldenses and the Papists from the 4th to the 13th centuries and later still between the Reformers and the Jesuits of the 16th century. This argument about the Bibles, which one, has been going on for a very long time. In fact, it's been going on for just after Christ. There were rival sects that had other documents very, very similar and very close to the ones that the Christians were using. But these early Christians knew some specific quotations that were there to prove that their scripture was truth and this scripture was error. 
these scriptures which became identified as error eventually over time got left behind and packed away and weren't used as much as this this uh, what's called the uh, the scriptural texts of the New Testament as we've now been put them together or have put them together, these have been used over and over and over through time. And I'll get to the reason why that is important a bit later. Les Garrett in 1982 in his book, Which Bible Can We Trust? He said, we need to understand that many of the new translations are taken from the old manuscripts. People think that these are more reliable. In actual fact, they are, what they are saying is that a manuscript found in a waste paper basket in a, mount, a cave in Mount Sinai and questionable manuscripts from Alexandria in Egypt are more reliable than the received text. What does he mean by older mm, translations or, or uh, older manuscripts? Well, think about this for a moment. You have a favorite book at home, which you read and read and read and read and read and read again and read again. Over time, you start to see that that book is fraying and falling apart. And once it's unusable, you would throw it away and go and buy yourself a new one. Now, even though the text inside is the same as the one you've just thrown away, the outer covering and the print date is new. So what happened throughout history is that the manuscripts that were reliable in the time of Jesus and the time thereafter were more and more and more used and they start to, as, as papyrus and these sort of scrolls do, they start to fall apart. And as people would open them up and roll them closed and roll them open and roll them closed, so these manuscripts would start to fray and pretty much go to pieces. What they would do then is they would then transcribe the information on, that's written down onto another one. And once they had taken word for word across, they would throw the old one away and they would have a new document. That then would be used and used and used and used until it was falling apart. And then they would, com they would copy again, word for word, one by one by one, to not only one copy, but they would make several of them, word for word copies. Then this old one that's falling apart, they would throw away. And this continued through time as mankind has uh, worked through the scriptures over time. So the reliable used scriptures have become younger and younger and younger and younger and younger. The ones which they didn't use, which I explained just now, were proven to be false at Jesus' time or just after Jesus. They were packed away and left because nobody was using them because they were so unreliable. Today, what channels like National Geographic do is they are comparing some fantastic findings and saying, wow, the original oldest manuscripts in the world have been found. And they compare this idea that old is better. And that's the satanic deception. Old, when it comes to scripture, is not necessarily better. What does matter is how many copies there are of the used ones. And the King James Version is made up from over 1900 copies that all confer to agree that the information contained in the King James Version is accurate. The two other streams that you have, one comes from the Sinaiticus text, which was found in a rubbish uh, a basket or a, a, a waste paper basket on Mount Sinai, and another one from the Alexandrian texts. And you'll remember that Alexandria was the seat of paganism in ancient Egypt. So, now, you've got this idea that's propagated into the world that the older scriptures are the best ones. In other words, let's go and refer to the old ones to determine what's accurate and what's not. And just the misunderstanding of old being better leads people to think that what they're now reading is more accurate than, than the, what's known as the newer transcripts or the newer scriptures. And because... These scriptures over years and years have been used and reused and reused and they've fallen away and fallen away. The reliable ones are today much younger than the old ones. He explains as he continues in his book, who but those Roman Catholic sympathies could ever be pleased with the notion that God preserved the true New Testament in secret for almost 1,000 years and then finally handed over to the Roman pontiff for safekeeping. All he's saying here is, how would it be possible with this argument that's going on between the theologians about 
which Bible is the correct one? Is the NIV is today seen as the most wonderful uh, scriptural evidence of God's grace and kindness? And that is the one that we should be relying on for our biblical studies? Or should it be the King James Version? Or should it be this, etc., etc.? This argument that's going on with the, between theologians is actually so silly. Because it would be really dumb to assume that the Lord hid or allowed to be hid the true scripture from mankind for over a thousand years and then gave it to the Antichrist and say, here, this is the truth. You look after this. There were two very interesting influences that came in to the new uh, translations like the American Standard Version, etc., and the New International Version. These two gentlemen were Westcott and Hort. Hort was a member of a secret society. In, jo in June, he joined the mysterial, mysterious company of the Apostles. He remained always a grateful and loyal member of the secret club, which now has become famous for the number of distinguished men who have belonged to it. These are people that had some strange affiliations and somehow got themselves into the position that they were now responsible for the translations of the old type documents into the newer Bibles. What I'm going to do is just give you a bit of background to who these people are and what they thought about the old type Bible, in, in other words the King James Version, and how it's influenced their translation, how their thinking has influenced the translation of the King James type documents into the modern Bibles. They, their studies and their work has become the foundation for most, if not all, of the newer Bibles. Now, I cannot say what they're saying, so I'm going to let them say it themselves. And most of the texts that I'm taking in this lecture, in this first part of this lecture, come from the following books written by the sons of Westcott and Hort, published in 1896. In the life and letters of Brooke Foss Westcott and the light and le life and letters of Fenton John Anthony Hort. This is them writing it themselves. September 29th, Westcott writes to Hort. As to our proposed recension of the New Testament text, our object would be, I suppose, to pre prepare a text for common and general use. With such an end in view, would it not be best to introduce only certain emendations to, into the received text and to note in the margin such as seem likely or noticeable? What these gentlemen were doing is they were looking at how they could make the text more available, more readily available in the world. But they wouldn't just translate it. They would make some emendations, some changes here and there, just change a little bit here and change a little bit there, and they would hide what they call the, uh, the, the adjustments or indications to the old text, they would hide that in the margin, in the, in the middle or, or at the bottom. And that way it wouldn't be as noticeable to the laity who would then just read through the Bible. In Life, Volume 1, he writes, I feel most keenly the disgrace of circulating what I feel to be falsified copies of Holy Scripture and am most anxious to provide something to replace them. The margin will give ample scope for our own ingenuity or principles. My wish would be to leave the popular received text except where it is clearly wrong. Here they're showing again how the margin is going to leave room for their ingenuity. They are now improving on the received text and they will leave it behind unless they realize that it's clearly wrong. So where the received text, the textus receptus, that's this uh, multitude of, of coinciding scripture, copies of scripture, all confirming that the King James is the right one, where the received text is incorrect, their ingenuity will allow them to change it, and this will be done in the margin. In 1860, in October, on the 15th, Hes Hort writes back to Westcott. He says, I entirely agree, correcting one word, with what you there say on atonement, that it is an immoral and material counterfeit, certainly nothing can be more unscriptural than the modern limiting of Christ's bearing our sins and sufferings to his death. But indeed, that is only one aspect of the almost universal heresy. So these gentlemen coming across as biblical scholars, in their secret letters to one another, they are outlining exactly what their belief is. 
uh, correcting one word, say for example in the immoral and material counterfeit of the atonement, that's Jesus dying on our behalf, he, which he later describes as a universal heresy. Do these people speaking serpent language or God language? Remember that these people on their translations is based the modern translations of the Bible. In 1870, on May 14th, Hort writes to Reverend J.L. Davies. He says, No rational being doubts the needs of a revised Bible, and the popular practical objections are worthless. 1 John 5 verse 7 might be got rid of in a month, and if that were done, I should prefer to wait a few years. All they're saying here is, let's use an example. No rational being is doubting that we need a new Bible, right? People are a bit tight in, in the King James Version. It's not giving enough room for expansion for their own ideas. So we need a new Bible. And an example of this would be 1 John 5 verse 7, which might be get rid of in a month. And after that, then we'll wait a few years. So what is 1 John 5 verse 7? Well, pause the, the DVD and go and have a look in your Bibles. If you have a King James Version, start with that. You'll see that it says, 1 John 5 verse 7, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. What does the uh, English Standard Version say in verse 7? For there are three that testify. The Good News Bible, there are three, that, there are three witnesses. In the International Standard Version, for there are three witnesses. Bible in basic English, and the Spirit is the witness because the Spirit is true. American Standard Version, and it is the Spirit that beareth witness because the Spirit is the truth. NIV, there are three that testify. NASB, there are three that testify. Can you see that that has been moved? The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Can you see that this has been taken out? This comes from their own documentation saying that we could remove this. This is probably one of the universal heresies like the atonement of Jesus Christ, his death on our behalf. And all the modern translations, it's been removed. The New Living Translation adds a little footnote that says, a few very late manuscripts add in the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. Can you hear the sinister voice behind that? A few late manuscripts add the following in. Well, it's late because just like your book that has been read and read and read and read and read and fallen apart, these late manuscripts are the ones that have been reliable throughout history. And the ones that you are referring to, where this has been removed, are the ones that have been thrown aside even by the very first Christians. In, on July 7th, in 1870, Hort writes, It is quite impossible to judge the value of what might appear to be trifling alterations, merely by reading them one after another. Taken together, they have an often important bearings which few would think of at first. We have successfully resisted being warned off dangerous ground. It is, one can hardly doubt, the beginning of a new period in church history. So far, the angry objectors have reason for their astonishment. So here you have the confirmation and the acceptance that they were warned to get off dangerous ground. You're fiddling with the word of God. Man will not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. And not only that, Revelation says, don't fiddle with this. You're going to lose your salvation. They say, we'll add some trifling changes in here. We'll change that there and a little bit there. And when you put it all together, they have a huge impact on Scripture. But when he's reading through your Bible, you will not notice it. That's what they're saying. Okay, so how many words... Now that we've gone 130 odd years down or 140 years almost from that time, how many words are gone out of the new translations? Would you believe that the New International Version, just as an example, removes over 17 complete verses and over 64,000 words? Now turn in your Bible and open up to the book of Acts. Now go to the middle of the book of Acts. Pause the DVD if you have to. Go to the middle of the book of Acts. Now, hold the Bible from Acts to Revelation. Have a look at that amount of paper that's in your hand. 
That is how much has been removed out of the modern translations. Over 64,000 words. Now, Dr. Frank Logson was the co-founder of the New American Standard Version Bible. He was involved in the translation and in the development of this Bible. Read this quotation. I must, under God, denounce every attachment to the New American Standard Version. I'm afraid I'm in trouble with the Lord. I wrote the format. I wrote the preface. I'm in trouble. It's wrong. Terribly wrong. It's frighteningly wrong. Are we so naive that we do not suspect satanic deception in all of this? That is the co-founder of the New American Standard Version. Writing that there's something going on which he, he has to step away from it and say that something is awful, awfully wrong. Okay, so let me give you some examples. Out of the Word of God, open your Bibles with me to Luke 4, Luke 4 verse 4. I'm going to read you the King James Version and then I'm going to give you one or two other examples. The King James Version states, And Jesus answered him saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. We've read this. What does the RSV Sam say? And Jesus answered him, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone. Do you see that every, by every word of God is missing? What does the NIV say? It is written, man does not live on bread alone. Turn with me now to Matthew 18 verse 11. The King James Version says, The Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. This is one of those key texts where it's proven that Jesus Christ came to save mankind. Matthew 18 verse 11. What does the RSV and the NIV say? Well, if you can, read it out loud. Read verse 11. You'll see that you can't because there is no verse 11. You'll have Matthew 18 verse 9, Matthew 18 verse 10, Matthew 18 verse 12. Verse 11 is gone. The Son of Man came to save that which was, which was lost. Why would they remove a text like that? Well, if you think of it now in the ecumenical society where the whole world is coming together under one religion, Jesus Christ has to be removed off his pedestal as the one Savior. And now you can go to Allah or Shiva or Vishnu or Jain. You can go to any of them and receive your salvation. So this text word has to be removed. What about Revelation 22.14? Do you remember that in Revelation 20 or in Revelation it says, don't fiddle with this prophecy of this book. You're going to be in trouble. Well, Revelation 22.14 in the received text, the King James Version says, Blessed are they who do his commandments, that they might have the, uh, the right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. What does the RSV state? Blessed are they that wash their robes. NIV, blessed are they that wash their robes. American Standard Version, blessed are they that wash their robes. Now, this particular text is an example of the argument that theologians will often have. And why when they hear this DVD, they'll say, oh, don't worry about it, that's a glosso. In other words, it's written in a different area of the Bible. Well, the problem with this is, if you change Revelation 22 verse 14, you rip the heart out of the chiasm. Blessed are they that do his commandments. In other words, this is a requirement that you may have the right to the tree of life and that you may enter in the gate and go into the city. The requirement to have the right to the tree of life and to enter into Jerusalem is if you do his commandments. So what do they have to do to make sure that you don't follow the commandments or you rather follow the commandments of men? Change it in the word that you have no defense. Now your Bible reads, blessed are they that wash their robes. And this means that you wash your robes in the blood of the lamb, some spiritual association between this verse and other verses. Well, that's not what the pure received text said, this one that has been relied on for so many hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Blessed of he that do his commandments now is related to blessed of he that wash their robes. Blessed are those who wash their robes. That's disgusting. What about Colossians 1 verse 14? The King James Version says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Again, a key text to identify how we gain salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ. Have a look what the RSV says. 
in redemption, in, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. What's missing? What's missing? Can you see? Through his blood has been taken out. What about the NIV? In whom we have the redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So that through his blood has been removed. You don't need this anymore. It's not through Jesus' blood. It could be through Allah or through Buddha. We have to take that little trifling alteration out. We, when you read through it, it won't make a difference to your reading. But when you put them all together, boy, it changes the word. That's what they said. What about the Old Testament? Daniel 3 verse 29 says in the King James, He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Here what's being seen is one of the most amazing uh, descriptions of how Jesus accompanies his people in the time of trouble. Daniel and his two colleagues are thrown into the fire, and they're, there, they're looking into the fire, and what do they see? Now they don't see three anymore, they now see four people. And the fourth one looks like Jesus. He looks like the Son of God. He's, he looks like the Son of God. What does the RSV say? And the appearance of the fourth was like a son of the gods, with a small g. NIV says, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. ASV says, and the aspect of the fourth is like the son of the gods. They are changing Jesus Christ into a son of the gods. So now Jesus becomes a god of thunder or maybe god of pantheism, pan, or maybe the god of the sun or maybe the god of the moon. Who knows? He's just a son of the gods with a small g, not the son of God. Let's have a look at prophecy. We know that prophecy is a profound way for the Lord to tell us what's going to happen in future. And that's a way that confounds Satan from being able to deceive mankind. Mark 15 verse 28 is a very important text in the King James Version that reads as follows. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says that he shall be numbered with the transgressors. Very important to say it was written in the Old Testament and by his death the scripture has been fulfilled. What's in the RSV? Can you read verse 28 for me? Mark 15 verse 28 if you have the revised standard version. Or the NIV, the New International Version. Can you read verse 28 please? Again what you'll find is 15 verse 26, 27, 29, 30. 28 has been removed. Taking out the or ability to prove by scripture the prophecies as laid out in the Old Testament. What about the Our Father? When Jesus was asked, Lord, how should we pray? He said, this is how you pray. And in the King James Version, it says, He said unto them, when you pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done as in heaven, so in earth. Give us day by day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Have a look for a moment what the, RSV and the NIV have to say about this. Turn with me to Luke 11, verse 2 to 4. Now the, the uh, prayer states, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. Some critical elements. Firstly, the hour is gone. So now it's not... Our Father anymore, it's now just Father, which art in heaven, proving who is God, gets removed. So it's now, Father, hallowed be thy name. Not our Father, which art in heaven, pointing at the real God. Then it goes on, thy will be done in heaven as in earth. That's removed, gone. Thy will be done? Man. So now we don't have to ask God for his will in our lives anymore. Try and play, pray the Lord's Prayer out of the New International Version. Oh, and the theologians will say, no, but it's still in Matthew 6. Who are you to determine what should and what shouldn't be in, Ma in Luke 11? The received text tells us over time and history that this is what the Word of God stated. What about baptism? We'll go into this in a later lecture. The, in fact, the final one about the uh, restoration or creation to restoration. But here's a statement about baptism specifically. 
The King James Version says the following in Acts 8 verse 36 and 37. Very important text. Turn with me. Acts 8 verse 36 and verse 37. I'll read it. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thy heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. There's a, a um, process that is underway here. This person is understanding what's going on. He's learning about Jesus. And he says, oh, what's stopping me from being baptized? And there's a declaration. If you believe with your whole heart, then you may be baptized. He says, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Boom. There's his, uh, his determination. And then he was baptized. Verse 38. What does the RSV say? As they came along the road, they came to some water. And here the eunuch said, See, here is water. What is preventing me from being baptized? And then what you'll find is, can you find verse 37? Please read it to me. Look in the NIV to see if you can find verse 37. Is it there? No. Because you don't have to any longer swear your allegiance to Jesus Christ. Even in the Afrikaans new uh, translation, you'll find that this text word has been going gone. This is, this is a type of litmus test that you can use on Bibles to check whether it's aligned with the received text or not. If you believe with your whole heart, then you may be baptized. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Boom! Gone out of the Bible. Why? Because now you can say, I believe that Allah is the Son of God. I believe that Shiva is the Son of God. Because nowhere in Scripture does it say, in order to be saved and baptized, you have to anymore have your allegiance to Jesus Christ. What about Revelation 1.11? Here's another example. King James Version says, I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What does the RSV say? Write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches. Can you see, I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last? It's gone. This is where Jesus is identifying himself. Matthew 4 verse 4 said, when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, he said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by what? Out of, by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And here these Westcott and Hort and these other characters have come along with the finger and said, no, that we should trifling alter range, change it there, take the blood out there, take uh, Acts 8 verse 37, remove that and do this and do that. And now we sit with a, a Bible that's easy to read that is corrupt to the core. You see, if you soften the word of God, you automatically soften the ability for a Christian to defend himself. Satan's war is now a war of deception. And if you remove the power and authority and truth of the word of God, in other words, if you can no longer uh, fight the war of the sanctuary, as it were, in the, New Test, in the New Bibles, if you cannot prove the sanctuary system out of the New Bible, you open yourself up for all types of deceptions. And not only that, you will open the door for false prophets, and where they will substantiate and you will accept new doctrines. And they do that using the Bible. Many of these false prophets, as we'll show you in the next lecture, do exactly that. They use the Bible to produce the most profound rubbish that you can imagine. Now this is the point where Satan's lies start to influence God's people. We've been through a whole host of other things, the New Age movement and this and that and the next thing. But now... In the Bible, Satan's finger has already been recognized. 64,000 words gone out of the new uh, uh, translations of the Bible. And I can't beat around this bush. I have to talk straight. I have to explain straight to you about Christian deceptions in the end time. We've just covered changing the word. I'd like to move on to the second topic in this lecture, which is food for thought. This is a very sensitive subject. But if it's not understood that the finger has been involved in changing the word of God to suit certain sat satanic deceptions, if that is not understood, then food for thought as a topic won't be understood. It is often commented that the food laws were done away with in the Old Testament. Well, that's correct. 
the food laws were done away with as part of certain ceremonials or the ceremonial law that is no longer in, in operation. Quite correct. But I'd like you to turn with me to Mark 7 verse 19. Turn with me, Mark 7 verse 19. I'm going to be reading from the English Standard Version Bible, and you turn in your Bibles and see what it says. The King James doesn't have this. The New Bibles do. My Bible says, this English Standard Version that I have here says, Since it enters not his heart but his stomach and expelled, question mark, then open brackets, thus he declared all foods clean. Close bracket. Now you'll see that this is a, a text written in red. If you have a red letter Bible, meaning it's Jesus speaking himself. Right? Here's a description where, where the Lord is going through this whole explanation to the people and he's speaking a parable. You see, in verse 17 it speaks about a parable. Let me read it to you. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from the outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart but his stomach and is expelled? And then in brackets, thus he, Jesus Christ, declared all foods clean. Here's a theological statement that is being made in the New Bibles. By saying this, I, this um, sentence, Jesus has therefore declared all foods clean. That's a statement, a theological statement in the New Bibles, right? It's there, printed. Okay. So Jesus removed all the unclean animals. We, there are no more unclean animals. Everything is clean. This is the idea that's being given. Now, can you remember where this text was? Have a look in your Bible. It was where? Mark 7, verse 19. Okay. Now, turn with me. We've in the Gospels, you've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And after John, you've got Acts, Romans, etc. Right, so you've got Matthew, Mark. Now turn through Luke, John, Acts. Three books later. Three books of the Bible later. Turn with me into Acts 10, verse 9. And we're going to read a passage there. Now, Jesus is no longer on earth. This is a time afterwards. These are, it's called the Acts of the Apostles. The Apostles that were the ambassadors of Christ that took this message out into the world. They obviously have accepted this truth of all foods being declared clean. Three books earlier in the Bible in Mark, all foods were now clean. Three books later, after Jesus has left, that's now obviously become commonplace, right? Well, let's check. Acts 10 verse 9. And Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. And he became hungry and wanted, to, wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens opened and something like a great sheet descending, let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and the reptiles and birds of the air. In other words, what is being said here is that Peter is hungry. He goes up to the roof of the house to pray. He's hungry, they're busy preparing food, but while he's hungry and he's up on top, he falls into a trance. And there he sees this sheet coming down from heaven, tied on the four corners, and inside this sheet are all types of four-footed beings and reptiles and disgusting things that you wouldn't have been allowed to eat. But remember that the Lord has done away with all the food laws in Mark 7, 19. So here in Acts 10, the sheet comes down. The very next verse says the following. And there came a voice to him. This is God speaking. Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time. What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. Okay, let's just cover this again. Peter goes into a trance. He sees the sheet descend down from heaven. Inside the sheet are all types of horrible things. God says directly to Peter, Peter, rise, kill and eat. Rise, kill and eat. That horrified Peter. And he says, not so, Lord, never. I would never eat anything that's un... Hold on, but why would he say I wouldn't eat anything unclean? Was Peter somehow associated to Jesus? Yes, he was. 
Would he have been in three books earlier in that conversation where Jesus declared all foods clean? Why then three books later does Peter say, never, I have never eaten anything that is unclean. Then God says to him, what God has made clean, do not call that common or unclean. Okay? And so Peter, three times, he says, never, Lord, never, Lord, never, Lord. He has to be pretty sure of himself. If God were to come into this room today and start speaking to me and tell me to do something that I previously wouldn't have done, I'd have to be pretty sure about my case if I was to push the Lord away and say, never, it's not a, it, I will never eat anything that's unclean. Imagine Peter's conviction of how, how strong he must have been in his belief. Not so, Lord, for I've never eaten anything that's common or unclean. Even though three books later, the Lord said you could, th earlier at least, three books later, the Lord now tells him to and he says, never. Christian scholars today stop at this statement, what God has made clean do not call common. They stop there and they say, there it is. See, from now on we can eat anything. Hold on a second. You remember you have to do a theme study throughout the Bible. Let's just continue. Let's read on a little bit more. Acts 10 verse 17 says the following. Now, while Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision he had seen might mean, behold, the men who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry at, for Simon's house, stood at the gate and called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. Just stop for a moment. What did that very first sentence say? Now, while Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision he had seen might mean. Okay, so here Peter's just had this vision. Now he's woken up out of the trance and he's thinking, man, I don't understand. What could this mean? I know it's definitely not about the food, so I'm inwardly perplexed. Man, Lord, what could this all be about? How does this work? And then while he's inwardly perplexed, perplexed, somebody knocks at the door. Let's read on. And while Peter was pondering the vision, in other words, while he was wondering and wrestling with himself, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. This is up to verse 20. So here he's wrestling with himself. What could this mean? I know it's not about the food. What, what is the Lord trying to tell me here? I don't quite understand. Explain to me. Explain. Um, um, there's a knock on the door. Some people are, are looking for Peter. Okay, what could this mean? And while he's battling to understand this vision, the Spirit comes and speaks to him and says, Behold, three men are looking for you. Interesting. Okay? The very next sentence in Acts 10 verse 17 says the following. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation. For I have sent them. This is the Spirit speaking, the Holy Spirit. And Peter went down to the men and said, I am the one you are looking for. What is the reason for your coming? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man, who is well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. So here the Holy Spirit comes down and gives, or, or God gives Peter a vision about eating something which he says it can't be about the food. I'm wondering what this is about. While he's battling with this, the Spirit says to him, rise, just like he said, rise Peter, kill and eat. He now says, rise, go down and acknowledge these three men. At the same time, these people say, an angel appeared to Cornelius and Cornelius has sent them to come and fetch him. So the Holy Spirit is busy putting together two groups of people that previously would have not come together. Let's read what it says. Read on. And on the following day they entered Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up saying, Stand up. I too am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many persons gathered. And he said to them, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate or visit any one of another nation. Now listen carefully. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. Does Peter now understand what this vision means? This sheet coming down from heaven? Yes, absolutely. He knows it's not about the food that's in there. Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Do not call anything that I've called clean. Do not call it common or unclean. It's not about the food. It's about going to acknowledge the Gentiles. It's about going to Cornelius' house. 
where previously a Jew wouldn't have been allowed to go. Here the Lord is giving him an opportunity. Rise, go down and go and preach the gospel to them. You see, if evolution were true, then we can eat everything and anything because we are all just in different levels of the same original thing. Right? We are all different levels of evolution. There's no difference between a snake or a cow or, for that matter, a human being. But if creation is true, it's a different story. Because like if, if any system is designed, it is designed as a system. Anything that has either human or godly intervention is designed in the form of a system. You take a car, your own car, you've got areas where you put stuff in and you've got areas where you take stuff out. And in between you've got certain dump valves, like you've got the oil filter, you've got the petrol filter, you've got the water filter, where all the gunk goes in. That's a closed system, right? The same with the human body. The food comes in and it goes out. And in between, there's certain areas that have to clean it as a, the food is going through. What about your house? That's a system. You bring the groceries in the front door or in one of the doors, and then it pretty much leaves your house through the lavatory. Because you don't cook in the toilet, you cook in the kitchen. There are certain areas that are unclean and there are certain areas that are clean. Wherever there's a system, there, well, let me, let me rephrase that. Wherever there's a, a, a creation or a development, either human or godly, there's a system. Right? There's certain things that come in, there's certain things that go out, and there's certain things that happen in between. It's exactly the same with creation. God created this world, and he created it as a system. The rivers flow down and they dump their things that they, the, all the animal products and whatever it is, they dump it out to sea. Now, all the animals that have been created along the seashore are the ones that eat up all these things which are taken off the land. Those are the little vacuum cleaners. Today, those are called, ah, mm, oh, wow, this is fantastic. Prawns, uh, calamari, uh, oysters, snails. Crabs. Those are the, the vacuum cleaners of the sea because it's a system, you see. Those are the things that go around and pick up the shark droppings after the sharks have eaten and they defecate in the water, the things filter to the bottom, all those stingrays and these things gobble up and clean the ocean, the vacuum cleaners. Today, Satan has turned the vacuum cleaners of the ocean into, <coughs> oh, this is fantastic. What about other areas of, of the, the uh, system that in, is creation in which we find ourselves? Well, it's very difficult today in, in this modern world to discuss this topic because this ideology has been so promulgated into the world that you can eat everything. That to give a description of what is and what is unclean is pretty much a sensitive subject. But understand that this idea in Mark 7, 19, that all foods have now been declared clean, is a lie and a satanic finger in the word of God. Isaiah 65 says something very interesting. I have spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people which walketh in a way that was not good after their own thoughts. A people that provoketh me to anger continuously to my face. While eating swine's flesh, and broth of abominable things in their vessels. They that sanctify themselves eating swine's flesh and the abomination and the mouse shall be consumed together, saith the Lord. You see, here's an indication. It's got nothing to do with the meat or the, the um, eating ceremonies in the ceremonial law. This has got to do with health. The Lord says, you will not go home and lick your toilet because it's unclean. You also won't go home and take the oil filter off and pour that oil back into your, your car engine because it's unclean. In the same way, I've created this as a system and there's certain things, even if this doesn't make sense to you, I know you can't see the picture where I am, but I'm going to identify the animals that you can and cannot eat. Right? Leviticus 11 verse 2 to 8 says, These are the living things that you may eat among all the animals that are on the earth. Whatever parts the hoof and is cloven-footed and chews the cud. Among the animals you may eat. In other words, it's got to have a cloven foot. A horse doesn't have a cloven foot. Can you therefore eat it? No. A sheep does. 
A cow does. It's got a cloven foot. And it must chew the cud. Read further. Nevertheless, among those that chew the cud or part the hoof, you shall not eat these, the camel, the hare, the pig, because it parts the hoof and is cloven-footed, but it does not chew the cud, is unclean to you. You shall not eat any of their flesh, and you shall not touch their carcasses, they are unclean to you. Now we don't maybe understand why, and we can think of all the reasons, but even in the slaughtering process, it's now all clean and this and that. That's not the point. God has created a system, and just like your child goes and sometimes, or your a dog maybe goes and drinks from the lavatory, because it doesn't understand the bigger picture, in the same way, the Lord is trying to protect us from playing on the highway. What about fish? Well, Leviticus 11 verse 9 to 12 explains that everything you eat has to have fins and scales. It's always got to have two things. It's got to have a cloven foot and it must chew the cud. Or it's got to have fins and scales. Does a shark have scales? No. Does it have fins? Yes. Can you eat it? No. Does a crab have fins or scales? No. This is a very sensitive subject in the world today because it means that the world or the Lord is not able to bless your bacon and egg breakfast. It's quite simple. But he does say the time of ignorance God winks at. That's what the Bible explains. So he's not cross for you not knowing. But once you do know, he can keep you in line with what your understanding is. We're going to be looking at another subject shortly. The question of hell and we'll cover this in as much depth as what we've done the others but there's going to be good news about hell and we'll cover that in part two